Police Research and Development, Government of India, and Joint Director, Enforcement Directorate, Government of India. As Deputy General, Inspector General of Police, training in Kerala Police Academy, Sir is responsible for the formulation of policy for training and, and imparting training to all cutting edge level police officers in the entire police force of Kerala state, ranging from station house officer to constables. And especially during this pandemic, Sir is instrumental to shift from the con conventional police training methods to the virtual training platform. In his current capacity, Sir is in the position to influence decision making and policy formulation. So there's enough field experience related to difficulties in poli policy implementation, gaps in policy and, and people expectation, field formation expectation from policymakers for successful implementation. Leader Sir has organized large number of sensitization programs for the students on road safety, drug abuse, online safety and social media for the schedule, scheduled tribes and scheduled caste on legal aid, different schemes of government for their upliftment, alcohol abuse in coordination with NGOs, schools and road transport department. Nidhasar is a natural team leader as well as a team builder and induces confidence in co-workers towards delivering a quality output. Sir always believe in leading from the front and institutionalizing the good practice. He is keen to impart the training to improve professionalism among police force in the state of Kerala, India. As a consequence of his outstanding work, Sir is awarded with the many appreciation Commendation from including badge of honor from for detective excellence by the Minister of Home Government of Kerala, which is a, which is only award to the to an officer in recognition of the outstanding contribution towards prevention and detection of crime, and also the Union Minister's Medal for Excellence in Police Training by the Union Home Minister Government of India. Now, most respectfully, I request Sri Neeraj Kumar Gupta, IPS, Deputy Inspector General of Police, Kerala Police Academy, to preside the webinar. Now I hand over the session to Nidesh sir. Before that, I have a small announcement to the participants. All participants are requested to strictly follow the instructions you receive through email. Make sure that your audio is mute and video is turned off. You can mention your queries in the chat box, which will be answered by the speaker by the end of the session. Nidesh sir, warm welcome to you the session. Please uh, follow. Please continue the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pradeep Devi. Uh, it is an honor and privilege for me to preside this uh, session on procedural justice and legitimacy in policing. Many times in India and outside India also, uh, questions have been raised on the actions of the policing and acceptance of those actions by public. Recently, all of you might have seen the example of one Dubey from Kanpur, where uh, the house of that gangster has been demolished by the local administration with the help of police and it has really raised eyebrows from many corners that under what act and under what rules that house was demolished. Uh, with this, I welcome and good evening to all the participants. As the moderator already mentioned that this is the 17th session in the series of webinar conducted by Indian Criminology and Forensic Science Association transformation through technologies need of the hour. The legitimacy of police in the eyes of public is important because it is fulcrum of relationship between police and the public. A significant amount of police work involves face to face interaction with the public. The nature of these interaction can vary considerably from encounter to encounter. Police are often faced with situation in which they have to deliver unfavorable outcomes to the individual or group they are dealing with. In fact, in most of the time, police deliver, uh, police face this situation because whenever there, are any, there is any dispute or issue, there are two parties involved. And whenever two parties are there, one party is always unhappy with the action of police. Uh, this can sometimes lead to overt resistance or aggressive behavior. Citizen compliance with police directive is therefore important and can help police to resolve issue more efficiently. Research in the procedural justice field has shown that if police treat citizen respectfully and make decision in a fair way, then it can enhance public perception of police legitimacy. That is why the fairness of procedure and implementation is very, very important for improving the perception of police legitimacy. 
this webinar would provide a summary of procedural justice and legitimacy in policing uh, now i introduce you today's speaker dr rick trinkner is the assistant professor arizona state university arizona usa and he is there since 2016 he is teaching and carrying out research in criminology criminal justice psychology of police and procedural justice and legi legitimacy theory he was part a part of a different committees such as faculty research committee graduates supervisory committee and alumni awards committee dr rick holds different position in american society of criminology american psychology law society he is working as the member of review panel of many international journal such as asian journal of criminology journal of child abuse and neglect journal of criminology european journal of criminology journal of feminist criminology journal of child and family studies journal of experimental criminology and many more he has more than 12 invited talks to different university all around the globe he contributed around 22 conference papers and seven posters on contemporary issues his book titled why children follow rules legal socialization and the development of legi legitimacy is one of the all time favorite in the field of criminology from oxford university press he has contributed around 16 research article in different in international journal he is an all time favorite among the real and learned officer today dr rick trinkner uh, will be discussing on the topic procedural uh, justice and legitimacy in policing all participants are requested to strictly follow the guidelines mentioned by the organizer on my behalf and on behalf of uh, the uh, this society i welcome dr trick uh, dr rick uh, and uh, uh, to deliver his session dr rick thank you very much for that wonderful introduction um, i'm a bit new to uh, to google meetup so when i share my screen um, let me know if you can uh, see my uh my slides uh, can everybody see my slides yes rick that, that's okay. great thanks okay uh, so thank you very much uh, again for your invitation to speak um, i'm really excited about our webinar today uh, so as was mentioned today i'm going to talk about procedural justice and legitimacy um, and uh and talking to the organizers of of the webinar um uh, i've kind of decided to kind of split my talk into two different parts uh, so probably about the first uh, two-thirds of my talk is going to be discussing the theoretical underpinnings of procedural justice and legitimacy theory um, particularly in the procedural justice arena um, this area has about five decades or about 50 years of work and nearly almost all of that work comes from psychology rather than criminology. Um, believe it or not, the ideas of procedural justice um, and uh, legitimacy that dominate criminology now uh, is kind of a relatively new integration into the field. Um, and personally, I find that it is uh, often the case that uh, many criminologists really aren't aware of this uh, theoretical background. Um, so I kind of want to take some time or a pretty good chunk of time to just talk about the underlying theory. As we're going to see as I kind of go through out everything today, uh, there is uh, a lot of stuff kind of going on under the hood, so to speak, when you start looking at procedural justice. Um, so for the, uh, the nerd criminologists in the room like myself, you're probably really going to enjoy part one. Um, and then I also know that there are a lot of law enforcement and practitioners in the room as well. So I want to spend the second part of my talk uh, discussing a couple of real world applications within the realm of policing specifically. Um, some applications that show that uh, integrating procedural justice um, into what police officers do uh, can actually have a real world influence, not only on the way that people view the legitimacy of the law, uh, but also their pro, uh, propensity to um, uh, comply and cooperate and those kinds of things. Um, so for the practitioners in the room, you might really enjoy part two more than part one. 
Uh, so I want to start off, once we get into it, with a really basic question. So what is legitimacy? Uh, and I'm going to give you two different definitions of legitimacy. And the reason why is because each of these reflects a different aspect of legitimacy that is really important. Um, although we often talk about legitimacy as kind of one single thing, it's becoming much more clear to us now that legitimacy is actually a multifaceted concept. So kind of in the broadest sense that you can imagine, Zeldich defines legitimacy as something is legitimate if it is in accord with the norms, values, beliefs, practices, and procedures accepted by the group. So from a police perspective, if the citizens or the community members believe that the police embody their norms or their legal values, or they embody the ways uh, the police embody the values of society, they're much more likely to accept the fact that police have this power, they have this position to regulate behavior and that that's a legitimate um, uh, relationship or that's a legitimate source of power that they have. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to in the literature as the normative justifiability of power. So as we're all aware, uh, police officers are given a bunch of power um, and that power is used to regulate people's behaviors and enforce the law. People uh, accept the legitimacy of this power when they believe that that power is in accordance with societal norms and values and beliefs and practices. Um, so that's kind of one definition that kind of talks about this normative justifiability aspect of power. It's not that police just have brute force, but rather they're seen as an embodiment of norms and values. Now, Tyler in 2006 takes this argument a bit further and he defines legitimacy as a psychological property of an authority, institution, or social arrangement that leads those connected to it to believe it is appropriate, proper, and just. So from this perspective, when Tyler defines it, he's talking about people believe or uh, people, when the people see police as legitimate, they see the police as occupying a special place in society that they are supposed to be occupying. Um, that it's, all, it's appropriate or proper for police uh, to be in this particular uh, position of power, to have this ability to regulate behavior, to have this ability to use coercive force if they need, uh, if they need to. So from Tyler's perspective, he really emphasizes this idea that legitimacy is all about the recognition of rightful authority. People view, essentially view the police as legitimate when they recognize that it is right and proper for the police to have this kind of power or have this place within society. Um, so those are kind of the two different definitions that are going to be structuring most of my talk, not most, but all of my talk and kind of what I'm discussing about uh, throughout today. Okay. Yes, yeah, go on, thanks. We're good? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So now that I've talked about kind of what is legitimacy, uh, next I want to talk about, well, why should we care about legitimacy? And we talked a little bit about this um, in the introduction to the webinar today, um, but I kind of want to take it a bit further. One of the perennial problems whenever you look at law or whenever you look at law enforcement is how do you get people to follow the law? You know, the reason why we have a legal system is to try to get people to comply with the laws and rules of society. Well, how do you get people to do that? Well, on one hand, you can rely on deterrence. You can essentially make it in people's self-interest to follow the law. Uh, so you can say, if you violate the laws, we're going to find you, we're going to uh, prosecute you, we're going to punish you. Um, so it is in your self-interest to not break the law, because if you do, you're going to get punished. And uh, just about every legal system I've ever heard of has some type of deterrence built into it, or that's a large part of it. The problem, though, with deterrence, ultimately, is that is it, it's incredibly resource heavy. Uh, to have an effective means of deterrence, you have to stick a lot of resources into your deterrence system. So if you just take a second, you think of what you need in order for deterrence to work. The first thing you need is a way to, uh, an extensive network to surveil the population in some kind of way, shape, or form. You have to be able to um, uh, know that people are violating the law. And the only way that you're going to know that people are violating the law is to surveil them. But surveillance isn't enough. 
You're also going to need a large deploy, uh, deployment of police officers and other types of legal agents uh, to ensure a credible threat of punishment. So it's not just that people need to believe that you'll know when they violate the law. They also need to believe that you are going to follow through on that punishment uh, with some type of police force. And then finally, you need some kind of system of incarceration to follow through on those threats with some kind of action. Now, the key thing is all of these things cost a lot of money. Uh, uh, surveillance costs money, law enforcement officers cost money, uh, systems of incarceration cost money, a court system costs money. So there's a lot of resources that need to be devoted if you're going to have effective deterrence. Um, and one of the issues that arises if you put all this money into solely deterrence is a lot of research really only shows that deterrence is only small to moderately effective. So you kind of have to think, are you really getting the most bang for your buck, so to speak, by putting all of your resources within to a solely deterrent model? <clears throat> Ideally, what you want um, and I, I would assume that most of the police officers would agree with me on this. Ideally, what you want is everyone to follow the law without the need for coercion. Uh, you want people to voluntarily follow the law so you don't need as much law enforcement, so you don't have to put as much resources within uh, your policing network. And this is precisely why legitimacy is so powerful. Uh, to, this, uh, to this point, there's been dozens, if not hundreds, of studies that have linked perceptions of police legitimacy or legal legitimacy uh, to things like uh, complying with the law, uh, cooperating with the police, um, trusting the police, empowering the police to, um, uh, to be those sources of regulation within the community, uh, satisfaction with the police. Uh, the list goes on and on and on in terms of how many outcomes have been linked to legitimacy. And most importantly, those uh, studies that, I, that I'm referencing right now, um, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are accounting for deterrence factors like certainty of capture or the threat of sanctions or how severe a particular punishment is. So again, uh, the reason why legitimacy has been um, is so powerful is because when people view the law, the police, the system as legitimate, they will voluntarily follow that system. Uh, they'll cooperate with police, they'll follow the law, they'll trust the legal system, and they will do that without the need for deterrence. <clears throat> and this is really powerful in a very pragmatic sense because pol uh, police departments have a very finite uh, source of resources. They only have so much money they can spend. If they can get a very large proportion of the population to follow the law uh, voluntarily, that means that the police can then take those small amount of resources and divert them to the areas that need them the most. So to the extent that the, uh, a community views uh, the, uh, the police department as uh, legitimate, this allows police departments to use their resources more efficiently. It allows them to uh, send those resources or focus those resources on the areas and people that need that deterrent effect the most. Um, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that deterrence isn't needed or that we should remove all of our, uh, our systems of deterrence. Uh, deterrence is obviously needed in the case of the criminal justice system. Um, rather, I'm just emphasizing that there's limited utility in how effective deterrence can be by itself. And if the police department is considered a legitimate uh, uh, source of authority within the community, this is going to allow police departments to use the resources behind their deterrent effects in a much, much, much more efficient way. So, so far I've talked about how do you define legitimacy. I've talked in a very general sense of why do we care about legitimacy. Um, in terms of uh, the science behind all of this, the next question we can ask is, okay, well, how do we operationalize legitimacy in the real world or when we're doing our research? What, how do we measure legitimacy? What is legitimacy? Um, and you'll notice here that I have operationalizing empirical legitimacy. Um, I do want to emphasize that there is a raging debate right now in criminology about this very question. Um, I could probably give a five-hour webinar simply on how to operationalize legitimacy, 
Um, not going to go too much into the weeds of this. We can talk about it in the uh, question and answer period if you would like. Um, but one of the things that we're arguing about is whether or not we should think of legitimacy in an empirical sense um, or in a normative sense within a legal uh, perspective. And I, again, we can talk more about this in the Q&A if you want, but at this point, uh, I just want to emphasize that everything that I'm going to be talking about today is from an empirical standpoint. Uh, so if you look at kind of the history of legitimacy research, there's largely been three basic ways that we've operationalized or measured legitimacy. The most classic measure is trust and confidence in police. So the degree to which I trust the police and the degree to which I have confidence that the police can do their job and can do their job well um, is highly associated with whether or not I view them as a legitimate authority. Um, other measures that are very popular in the literature is this idea of obligation to obey the police. So when I see the police as legitimate, I feel it is my duty um, or I have a strong internal obligation to obey what they're saying. Uh, when we talk about obligation to obey, we're talking about uh, an internalized value. The idea here is that people have this value that it is right and proper for them to follow the police. And once that gets internalized, it then becomes an obligation. So uh, if somebody feels a strong obligation to follow uh, the police or follow the law, you don't really need a lot of coercion, you don't need a lot of uh, threat or force, but rather people are just going to voluntarily follow it uh, because they feel it is their duty to do so. Um, and the obligation to obey peace largely flows out of this idea that legitimacy represents a recognition of uh, rightful authority. Now, like I said, there's a raging debate going on in criminology um, about how we operationalize legitimacy. Um, I do want to emphasize that there is argument right now that we shouldn't be considering obligation as legitimacy. Rather, it's something that's happening later. Um, again, I don't want to go into too much detail about this at this point, but if you want to talk more about this in the Q&A, we can. Um, and then the, the final kind of uh, operationalization or the final kind of component you see a lot in the research is what we call normative alignment, um, or sometimes it's referred to as moral alignment. And again, this is this idea of um, uh, if a citizen views a police officer as legitimate, um, they will believe that they have a sense of shared values with law enforcement. So law enforcement shares the same kind of values that I do about uh, what the police should be doing, how they should be doing it, what are the, uh, the appropriate legal values, um, and so forth. Uh, and this aspect kind of gets into that normative justifiability of power that I had talked about earlier in the talk. Um, so if you dive into the legitimacy literature, these are usually the three major measurement strategies that you're going to run into. Trust and confidence in police, obligation to obey, um, and this idea of normative alignment. So where does legitimacy come from? Why do people see the police as legitimate authority? Um, a common argument, especially an argument that you hear um, within the, uh, the public, is that police are legitimate to the extent that they can control crime. So essentially, if uh, crime, if the police are effective in controlling crime, the public will see them as legitimate. If the police are um, ineffective at controlling crime, then the public will view them as illegitimate. <clears throat> so the idea here is that legitimacy comes from police's deterrent kind of aspect. Uh, legitimacy comes from uh, police officers' ability to enforce the law, control crime, uh, deliver uh, punishments and rewards, and so forth. Uh, the problem, though, with this kind of argument um, is that it actually ends up having fairly limited explanatory utility. Uh, believe it or not, um, uh, a bunch of research shows that for the most part, um, um, police officers' ability to control crime is not as strongly predictive of their legitimacy as you would imagine. And to give kind of an example of this, I just want to talk about uh, U.S. crime rates for, any, uh, for a second. So if police officers' legitimacy comes from their ability to control crime, you would expect that 
uh, perceptions of police legitimacy should uh, track with the crime rates in any given uh, area. So when crime is really high, legitimacy should be really low. Uh, when crime is really low, legitimacy should be really, really high. However, this isn't actually what you see when you look at polling and crime data within the United States. So for example, if we look at crime data uh, from about 1993 to 2018, we see a marked decrease in pretty much almost every single crime that we measure within the United States, both violent crimes and property crimes. Uh, if you're looking at this graph here, uh, the, the numbers that have FBI, those are based on arrest measures of crime. Um, the numbers that come from the BJS, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, those are victimization measures, which have nothing to do with arrest rates. And we can see this very steep, very strong decline within crime rates. Now, again, if police legitimacy is coming from their ability to control crime, then we should expect that from 1993 to 2018, we should see perceptions of legitimacy going up. If crime is going down this whole time, we should also see crime going up. But that's not actually what we see in national polls. So this is a national poll from Gallup. Uh, Gallup has been tracking whether or not people are confident in police um, going all the way back to uh, the mid 80s, I believe, but this is data from 1993 to 2017. And you can see that in some years it goes up, in some years it goes down, and then it might go up a little bit, and then it might go down a little bit. The important thing I'm trying to emphasize here is realize that the picture of confidence, the picture of legitimacy, does not mirror crime rates. So again, it seems that legitimacy cannot solely rest on the ability of law enforcement to control crime. Um, for, the, uh, for law enforcement, they have to take kind of a wider net or a wider uh, look at about where their legitimacy is coming from. Now, when you look at the literature, there has just been so many different factors that have been identified that are associated with perceptions of police legitimacy. Um, so I have H here from procedural justice to distributive justice. There's research on biased policing. Um, and when there's more biased policing, there's less legitimacy. There is some research linking the effectiveness of police to control crime to legitimacy. Uh, there's work uh, looking at the degree to which the police follow the law that restrict their behavior um, and how that's tied to legitimacy. Similar to that is corruption. Uh, other stuff has looked at more uh, neighborhood level factors like collective efficacy and concentrated uh, neighborhood disadvantage. And I will emphasize this is a very small list. Uh, if you read all the police legitimacy literature, there's probably been, I don't know, 30 or 40 different variables or different factors that have been identified as sources of police legitimacy. But what we're going to talk about today is this idea of procedural justice. Now, why am I going to focus on procedural justice? The reason why is because there's substantial amounts of work showing that procedural justice is a major predictor of police legitimacy. Uh, in many studies, particularly within the United States, it is often the strongest or the best predictor of police legitimacy out there. Uh, procedural justice is, always a, is also a strong predictor of compliance with the law, um, and it's also strongly associated with cooperation with the police as well. Um, um, the two articles that I cited down there, Walters and Bol Bolger and Bolger and Walters, uh, both of those are meta-analyses. Um, and the results from those meta-analyses are fairly stark, in my opinion, that procedural justice is a major predictor of both legitimacy and compliance and cooperation. Okay, and I also want to emphasize that this, uh, the links between procedural justice and legitimacy, compliance, and cooperation uh, are very strong in terms of policing, but it's not just restricted to policing. So there's research out there that has found almost identical results in terms of um, correctional officers um, and how correctional officers interact with inmates. We see similar relationships in terms of the court system, uh, the degree to which people believe courts are procedurally fair, strongly legitimate the court system. It makes people, or um, it increases the likelihood that people will accept a court decision, even if they're on the, uh, the losing end of that decision. Uh, there's research in terms of the judges uh, within those courts as well. 
Uh, to the degree to which people believe judges are procedurally just, the more likely people are to see the judge as a legitimate authority that uh, should be followed or supported. Uh, we see this in terms of parole and probation officers. Uh, we see this in terms of defense attorneys. Um, I'm reviewing a paper right now that shows that the degree to which juvenile um, uh, offenders believe that their defense attorneys are procedurally fair with them, um, the more likely those juvenile offenders are going to see the broader system as legitimate. Um, and it's not only just restricted to legal authorities as well. We also see very similar results when we look at the relationship between parents and children and what creates effective parent-child bonds. We see it in the classroom in terms of teachers and students. Uh, we see it in the business world in terms of how supervisors interact with their workers. Um, and we even see it among politicians as well. Uh, so people are more likely to support politicians and see them as legitimate to the degree to which they believe the politician is procedurally fair. So the, the thing I'm emphasizing with all of this work is trying to show that this is a fairly ubiquitous finding. The importance of procedural justice in creating better relationships between authority figures and individuals is seen really throughout any type of authority structure that I personally have ever looked into or ever studied. So I wanna emphasize that this isn't just something special about policing per se. Obviously it has very important applications for uh, the realm of policing, um, but the importance of procedural justice um, emphasizes that this is something about um, how we interface with authorities more broadly. Um, because you see the themes that I'm gonna talk about in this talk, um, throughout all kinds of different literatures on all kinds of different types of authority figures. Uh, so what is procedural justice? Um, the easiest way to explain what procedural justice is is to talk about it in conjunction uh, with its partner, uh, which is distributive justice. So if you imagine that you have an interaction with a police officer, so you interact with that police officer and that interaction is gonna produce some kind of outcome. That might be a warning, uh, it might be a fine, it might be an arrest, or it could be uh, the police officer solves some kind of problem, or the police officer gives you some information, um, you know, but there's some kind of outcome. Well, the degree to which people view that outcome as fair is what we call distributive ju uh, justice. So fairness within the outcomes of policing is considered distributive justice. Now what procedural justice is, is everything that happened leading up to that outcome. Um, so when the process um, that occurs, that arrives at a particular outcome is perceived as fair, that's what we call procedural justice. <clears throat> so procedural justice is really emphasizing that interaction. What happens the, to that uh, during that interaction? How does the officer interact with uh, the community member, the person that he or she is interacting with? Um, you know, what's their demeanor like? That's really what we're focusing on when we're talking about procedural justice, is the manner in which police police rather than uh, the outcomes that emerge from policing. I'm not saying that outcomes are not important, uh, it's just procedural justice focuses on the manner to a much greater extent. Um, how do we measure procedural justice or what does it mean for an officer to behave in a procedurally just way? Uh, this is something that the field has been arguing about since 1975. Um, similar to legitimacy, there's all kinds of different components that have been positioned in terms of this is what a procedurally just process looks like. Um, for me, the most useful um, uh, component or the most useful uh, area or piece here is Tyler and Blader's dichotomy, where they distinguish between the quality of treatment and the quality of decision making. So when you're assessing the process or when you're assessing um, the, uh, the procedures and the process that a police officer is following during that interaction, on one hand, you can think about, well, how did that officer treat that person uh, within that particular interaction? Uh, were they respectful? Did they show caring motives? Were they benevolent? What was their overall demeanor? Did they behave in an honest and open fashion? You know, how did they treat this person while they were arriving at a particular outcome? On the other hand, you can think about it in terms of quality of decision making. Um, did the police officer give somebody a voice? In other words, did the police officer uh, allow somebody to express their opinion about it? 
You know, if the police officer is pulling somebody over, uh, let's say for, for speeding, did the police officer ask them, well, why were you speeding? Did they give them some kind of voice to speak up and explain their side of the story? You can also think about it in terms of neutrality or impartiality. Um, you know, are police being neutral when they interact with people um, on the street or are they being biased or are they being partial? Are they letting their own biases dictate how they're gonna interact with that particular person? Um, other aspects of decision-making are things like accountability. So um, are police accountable for the process that they followed within that decision-making capacity? Um, are they transparent? Are they explaining to people why they're arriving at the particular outcome that they're arriving at? So if they're gonna give them a ticket, are they explaining to them, well, this is why I'm gonna give you a ticket? Um, so not just in terms of the treatment, you can also think of the process in terms of, well, if there's a decision-making process that leads to that outcome, what were the features of that decision-making process? And were that, was that decision-making process perceived as fair? Did it have voice? Was it neutral? Um, and so forth. So a police officer that wants to embody procedural justice is going to be a police officer that when he or she interacts with individuals, they're respectful, they're benevolent, uh, they allow the citizen or they give the citizen a voice and they allow the citizen um, to explain their side of the story. Um, they try to treat everyone um, uh, neutrally to the greatest degree possible. Um, and they stop and explain themselves and they, um, they are, they're transparent when they interact with individuals. Um, okay, so we've kind of explained what procedural justice is, the different kind of components. The next question we can ask ourselves is, well, as I said before, there's dozens, if not hundreds of studies showing the strong links between procedural justice and legitimacy and compliance and cooperation. Um, so the question is, well, why do people seem to be so sensitive to procedural justice? Why is it so important to people that they feel like they um, uh, need to be treated fairly? Um, one of the things that I didn't emphasize earlier that I should have, um, there are, there are um, again, many, many studies showing that even if somebody gets a negative um, uh, outcome, uh, you know, they had a fine or um, a, um, uh, they were arrested or something like that. Uh, so even when it's negative, they have a much more positive view of that interaction, even if it's a negative outcome, so long as they believe that the police officer treated them or was procedurally fair during the interaction. So people are incredibly sensitive to this idea of procedural justice. Um, and the key thing you really have to understand about why people are sensitive is realize that the procedural justice literature flows from a psychological understanding of group dynamics within hierarchical systems. Um, and it, it rests on the idea about how do we get people to internalize group norms, but it's built on this idea of uh, these dynamic relationships in which one person has power and another person has less power. Now at the heart of that dynamic relationship, you'll see this all over the theoretical literature, is two sources of human motivation. So on one hand, you can think of human motivation in instrumental terms. So for those of you that are um, familiar with rational choice models or self-interest models, the idea here is that human beings perform hedonistic calculus of some kind where they think about a particular consequence and they, uh, they weigh the uh, potential benefits and they compare the potential benefits of that behavior to the possible cost. And if the benefits outweigh the cost, then they're going to engage in that behavior. If the costs outweigh the benefits, uh, then they're not going to engage in that behavior. Um, that's what we mean uh, by instrumentality. And this idea about instrumental motivation is really the basis for the deterrent model of policing. Again, I'm going to deter crime by making it in people's self-interest to not engage in criminal behavior, to make the costs outweigh the rewards of criminal behavior. So we have this kind of one aspect of human motivation, which is instrumental motivation, but then procedural justice talks about how there is a second source of human motivation as well. And this is what they call relationality or relational motivation. And the idea here is that human beings are fundamentally social creatures. 
Um, we don't exist uh, solo, so to speak, but rather we exist to be part of groups. And because of that, we have a strong, strong fundamental instinct or need to belong to groups around us. Um, and group membership is incredibly important to uh, our identity, how we define ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we think of ourselves, and by extension, our self-worth. And what we're going to see uh, in a little bit is that this idea that people are powerfully motivated to establish relationships with other people and care about being members of particular groups is really going to form the basis for the procedural justice model of policing. Um, as I'm going to talk about on the next slide, procedural justice essentially leverages this relational motivation uh, to get people to uh, engage, uh, uh, engage in compliance behavior and cooperation. Um, so within a procedural justice model, it's really this relational motivation that's driving everything to a much greater extent than the instrumental uh, motivation. And this is often what we see within the empirical literature as well. In many instances, people's behavior are driven much so, much more so by relational concerns than instrumental concerns. <clears throat> okay. So from a procedural justice perspective, what procedural justice effectively is, it's a signaling device. So it is a signaling device that an authority can use to tell somebody else that they are part of the group that the authority represents. <clears throat> so essentially, we, uh, on average, we treat people that are within our groups better than we treat people that are in our out groups. Um, uh, when we are part of a group, we expect a particular uh, um, uh, level of behavior, or we expect people to treat us in a particular way. Um, so when a police officer, and in this case, a police officer represents the community or represents society, when a police officer treats a citizen with respect, when a police officer gives a citizen a voice, when a police officer is neutral um, and is benevolent and has all those good quality um, of treatment and decision-making factors, what they're essentially doing is they're signaling to people that the person that they're interacting with, that that person has value, that that person has status, that that person um, is within the group that the police officer represents, which is again, uh, society at large. So essentially procedural justice is a way to send messages of group inclusion. It's a way for um, uh, a citizen to feel that they're a valued member of society and that tr uh, police officers will treat them as a valued member of society. So it's kind of a way to engage that relational motivation that I was talking about before. And when you engage that relational motivation, when people now all of a sudden believe that they're part of the same social group as the police officers are, they're going to be much more likely to recognize the um, authority figures that uh, regulate group behavior, which in this case is police or law enforcement. And they're going to be much more likely to internalize group behavior, group norms or group values. So they're actually going to align their behavior in terms of what the group finds acceptable. And to the extent that the law represents group norms and values, people are going to align their behavior with societal laws when they feel that they are part of society. And procedural justice is a way for police officers to signal that inclusion within society. Now, over a long period of time, this is um, uh, some of my work within legal socialization, um, continuously, procedurally just policing over time. So sending individuals consistent messages of inclusion every time they interact with police officers or interact with the law, that will increase their identification with society. Uh, you can imagine that if you tell somebody over and over and over again, you are part of my group, you are part of my group, you are part of my group, after a while, people are going to start developing that identity or they're going to start to integrating that membership within that group into their, uh, their own identity. So continuous procedurally just uh, policing increases the levels with which people are going to identify with society. The more people identify with society, the more likely they're going to internalize the, the norms and values of societies that underwrite or undergird the law, the legal system. <clears throat> 
And you can imagine the more I'm internalizing behavioral norms, the more I'm internalizing behavioral values, the more likely I'm going to feel it is my duty or the more likely I'm going to want to follow the law and cooperate with legal authority. Not because I'm being forced to, but because I've internalized these norms or I've internalized these values. So over time, procedurally just policing over time um, has the propensity to actually over time create um, more, um, uh, more law abiding citizens through this socialization process. And if you juxtapose this with uh, continuous procedurally unjust behavior over time, so people that constantly experience unjust policing behavior, um, you can imagine that rather than sending messages of inclusion, now you're sending messages of exclusion. You're not part of the group that the police represent. You're not part of society. You're part of some other group. And if you're constantly told that you're part of some other group, you're not going to identify with the group law enforcement represents. If you don't identify with that group, you're gonna reject that group's norms and values. And if you reject societal norms, if you reject societal values, you're gonna become much more cynical, much more antagonistic to law enforcement, and much more defiance in the face of societal laws. And as Justice and Mears talks about in their paper on the educative function of the criminal justice system, this is how you create anti-citizens. This is how you create people that exist outside of our uh, society. Okay. Um, so that is kind of procedural justice in a nutshell in terms of how we define it, how we measure it, why it's important, why it stimulates legitimacy. Um, I do want to talk about a couple of caveats before we get into the application portion of the talk. Um, so you see this a lot, um, you see this kind of representation a lot within uh, particularly criminological research, the idea that um, the procedural justice model of policing argues that procedural justice is the most important factor in predicting police legitimacy as a de facto principle. So in all cases, at all points, in all societies, in all communities, procedural justice is the most important uh, factor in, legit in legitimation. And that's actually not true uh, when you look at it in terms of the, uh, both the theory and the empirical work. Um, the links between procedural justice and whether or not that is going to legitimate police um, is in many cases strongly depends on the relationship between police and citizens. And to really emphasize this point, I want you to think about, as I just talked about, procedural justice um, is a signaling device or it's a way to communicate group value or a way to communi uh, communicate to people that they are a member of the group. What if the citizen doesn't identify with the group the police represent to begin with? Um, or what if the citizen has no interest at all in being part of that group for whatever reason? Um, in these cases, we would expect that <clears throat> instrumental factors, um, you know, for example, police officers' ability to control crime or the degree to uh, which they're not corrupt may be more important within uh, the legitimation process than relational factors like procedural justice. Um, so again, whether or not procedural justice is going to be um, the most important factor um, uh, in terms of whether or not somebody sees the law as legitimate is going to depend to an extent on the relationship that that person has with the group that the police represent. Um, and to kind of emphasize this in terms of the empirical literature, I want to draw your attention to four particular studies. Um, so Bradford looked at police legitimacy. He did a survey uh, of, uh, uh, in South Africa in terms of police legitimacy and um, procedural justice and compliance, all the things that I was talking about. Um, Jackson et al. did a very similar type of study in Pakistan. Uh, Tankaby did an almost identical study in Ghana. Um, and then most recently, Sun et al. Uh, did, again, pretty much the same type of study, but he did it within China. Now, interestingly, all four of these studies actually found that effectiveness was uh, uh, a better predictor of legitimacy than procedural justice, or essentially about the same strength of a predictor as procedural justice is. So all four studies um, uh, found that procedural justice wasn't actually the most important thing in predicting legitimacy, um, but rather it was effectiveness. <clears throat> 
Now, the reason why I bring these four studies up is because all four of these studies discuss the results in terms of the historic relationship between the police and the citizenry. So in South Africa and in Pakistan and in Ghana, um, the police department there has historically represented colonial powers. Um, it did not represent uh, the people that, uh, that lived there, but rather these external forces. Um, and what all those individuals talked about, Bradford, Jackson, and Tankaby, is that, <laughs> well, because the population has historically seen the police as represented some faraway colonial power rather than uh, uh, the native population. Um, it's because of this that they didn't care so much about procedural justice because they didn't care, uh, they weren't uh, they didn't care as much about being a member of that group, or they didn't identify with that colonial power, but rather they saw uh, something else. Um, so because they identified with a different group, procedural justice wasn't as strong of a predictor as effectiveness. Don't get me wrong, procedural justice was still associated with more legitimacy in these cases. It just seemed like effectiveness was a stronger predictor than procedural justice was. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the China study that Sun et al. did, well, Sun et al. talked about how uh, China has historically been an authoritarian regi regime that in many cases the legal system uh, works in a procedurally unfair way. So you can imagine that within China, um, if you have experienced many years of procedurally unfair behavior, uh, from a procedural justice perspective, that means that the police there are sending signals um, that you aren't part of the group that the police represent, um, so you're not going to identify with that group, and hence you're not going to uh, be as sensitive uh, to procedurally just information, uh, because again, it's not that you have group membership to begin with. Um, so again, the, the, the basic point I'm trying to make here is don't leave this talk thinking that in all cases, at all points in time, procedural justice is the more, most important legitimating factor. It is an important legitimating factor, but there are other things that could potentially be going on depending on uh, the historic relationship uh, between the police and the community that you um, are studying or if you're a police officer that you are interacting with. Uh, and then the last caveat that I want to talk about, uh, for those of you that might be familiar uh, uh, some of the some of the more recent debates, there's been a lot of questions about causality, um, of whether or not we have truly shown causal relationships between police procedural justice, police legitimacy, and uh, compliance and cooperation with the law. <laughs> so there's tons of cross-sectional and longitudinal support. Um, there's a lot of experimental evidence from the laboratory. Uh, the problem is, is that the laboratory work is not focusing on police interaction specifically. Um, so really what's missing in the field right now is there has not been substantial field work within the police context. There's been a bunch of survey research, a bunch of longitudinal and cross-sectional research, but we haven't seen a lot of field work. Um, and in particular, uh, we haven't seen a lot of randomized controlled trials within the field as well. Um, and to date, some of the RCTs have produced mixed results. So in uh, some instances, we see that um, uh, procedurally fair policing uh, within the real world is in fact shown to uh, cause higher perceptions of legitimacy and compliance. Um, other studies have failed to show that within the field as well. Um, so this is something that, that that's still uh, developing. So kind of take, take this uh, uh, as you see fit. Okay, uh, so I'm just about running out of time, so I might have to go uh, a little quick um, uh, through the applications, uh, but I really wanted to talk about two specific applications uh, where I believe that procedural justice either has been used effectively to induce uh, compliance and cooperation or is ripe to be um, um, uh, applied uh, in, in a very powerful fashion. And the first part I want to talk about is this idea of focused deterrence programs. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about pro, uh, Chicago's Project Safe Neighborhoods. So this is a focused deterrence program whose goal is to reduce gun violence. Um, Chica some Chicago neighbors um, 
Some of the neighborhoods within Chicago are some of the most violent neighborhoods within the entire United States um, that have just been plagued by gun violence for many, many, many years. Um, and Project Safe Neighborhoods is aimed at reducing that gun violence in those particular neighborhoods. And it does this by focusing on high risk known gun offenders. Um, so the entire program is built around parolees that are leaving jail after being incarcerated for a gun offense. Um, and the whole point is to try to get them to not to reoffend. Um, <clears throat> And there's kind of two prongs to this uh, focused deterrence program. So on one hand, you have this pulling levers strategy. So the idea here is that the criminal justice system is gonna pull every deterrent lever that it possibly can to place as much deterrent emphasis or deterrent pressure as it can on these parolees. So these parole parolees are subject to increased law enforcement. Um, they're subject to uh, more certain uh, sentences. Uh, if they reoffend again, uh, they usually uh, face very severe and very stiff punishments, in some cases up to 20 or 30 years in jail. So you have this very strong pulling levers deterrent piece. And then this other prong is reentry services. So providing services to people, trying to get them housing, trying to get them a job, uh, trying to help them get their life back together once they are um, um, uh, released from uh, prison. Now, one of kind of the crown jewels of this program is what they call forums or offender notification meetings. Now, when a parolee gets out within a week or two of them getting out of incarceration, they're invited to attend these forums. And these forums are 60 minute meetings in which the parolees come together with uh, local criminal justice agents, so it could be police officers, or it could be people from FBI, or it could be people from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, community members are there, so people that live in the community that the parolees live in. And then you also have service providers, people that can help them get a license, people that can help them drive, um, and so on and so forth. I um, mean, basically for the first 20 minutes, the criminal justice agents uh, talk with the parolees and what they do is they talk about how this pulling lever strategy that I just talked about. So essentially what they tell them is, we know who you are, we know what you went to jail with, we are watching you and we are watching you very closely. One mess up, you know, one little tiny thing and you're gonna go back to jail for a very, very long period of time and we are gonna respond very, very swiftly to that as well. Um, so that's really that deterrent message. The community then comes in, the community members, and they talk about how they care about the parolees, they want the parolees to succeed, um, uh, they want them to have a better lives, but at the same time, they absolutely will not tolerate violence within their communities anymore. So if they see those individuals engaging in any criminal behavior, they will report them to the police. Um, and then finally, the last 20 minutes, the service providers come in and they talk to the parolees about all the different services that they have available to them to help them succeed. So this is kind of what the forum messages look like. The reason why I'm emphasizing it is because even though there are a lot of deter uh, focused deterrence programs out there, the Chicago model really set itself apart from everybody else because from the very beginning, Chicago rooted their um, uh, their approach within an idea of procedural justice. So all of those community individuals, those criminal justice agents, all of those individuals are instructed to speak to people within a procedurally just manner. So they, they speak to them respectfully. They're not just shouting at them. They're speaking to them respectfully. The parolees are given an opportunity to talk about their opinions and tell their side of the story. Uh, they let them know that this is the way that they're treating all the parolees that are coming back to the community um, um, uh, after being incarcerated for a gun offense. So it's, it's a very neutral process. So these forums just exude procedural justice in every way, shape, and form. Now, if you look at whether or not Chicago's Project Safe Neighborhoods program has been effective, there's been a couple of evaluations up to this point. If we look at the neighborhood level, um, and you look at the two neighborhoods that they focused 
uh, their, uh, their project safe neighborhoods efforts in versus matched control neighborhoods, you see a 37% decrease in homicide rates. Um, so the program got instituted between 2000 and, uh, between January of 2002 and July 2003. And as this graph shows, you can see there's just a massive decrease in the homicide rates <coughs> within the neighborhoods that Project Safe Neighborhoods was active in. And while the control group saw a small decrease, it certainly wasn't as strong as the PSN group. Now, the really interesting thing about this evaluation, when they looked at all the different facets or all the different pieces um, of the Project Safe Neighborhoods program in terms of increased police presence, increased severity, um, more certainty in terms of getting caught, all those deterrence aspects that we were talking about, you actually found that whether or not a parolee, or I'm sorry, the thing that you found was most predictive of that decrease in homicide rates is the percentage of parolees within that neighborhood that attended forums. The more people attended forums, the more likely uh, or the, the, the bigger the decrease was in homicide rates, which again suggests that there's something about these forums that is especially driving these decreases in violent gun homicides. Um, another evaluation looked at it at an individual level. Uh, so rather than looking at neighborhoods, they looked at it in terms of specific parolees. And they compared parolees that went through the PSN program with a group of matched parolees that didn't go through the PSN program. Uh, and what they found is that for those that uh, attended the forums, again, forum attendance, these procedurally just forums, uh, they were more likely, uh, they had a longer time on the street before they got uh, reincarcerated. Forum attendance was also the strongest predictor of a reduced likelihood of new offenses. So people that went to that forum uh, were less likely to engage in new offenses and they were less likely to engage in serious crimes like guns and violence. So again, this procedurally just forum um, seems to be having a particularly big influence on individuals' uh, violent gun behavior. And then the last evaluation that just came out uh, uh, last year, last December? Anyway, um, it looked at the forum specifically and it looked at these different mechanisms of change. So the different things that they were expecting the forum to uh, emphasize. And what this study did is it, it uh, measured or it surveyed a bunch of parolees right before they attended the, uh, the forum. And then it surveyed a bunch of other parolees right after they had heard the forum message. And what they found is that, so when people actually uh, attended these forums, after they attended them, um, they were much, they had much stronger, or much higher perceptions of risk. So people that heard the message were much more likely to say, yeah, if I engage in gun crime, um, uh, really bad things are gonna happen. I'm, it's a high likelihood that I'm gonna be caught and there's a, there's a high likelihood um, um, that I'm gonna go away for a very severe uh, uh, prison sentence. So uh, it was effective in delivering that deterrence message, but this is um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the next bars are what I want to draw your attention to. We also saw that forum attendance really increased uh, uh, off, um, parolees' perceptions of procedural justice of police. It increased their felt obligation to obey the police. And it also increased the extent to which they felt that um, uh, the police represented, it, represented a similar sense of norms or values that they did. So the forums were effective in terms of actually increasing uh, perceptions of procedural justice and increasing the legitimacy, the perceived legitimacy of the law. So again, realize that the forms were driving uh, the crime decline to a much greater extent than everything else. And those forums were also changing perceptions of parolees in terms of uh, procedural justice and obligation. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this graph because I'm running out of time. Yeah? Oh. Uh, okay, uh, so um, yeah, I'll go really quick now because I'm just about out of time. Um, 
So what does this application show? It shows that procedural justice uh, and legitimacy can actually be effective in the real world. And not only that, it can be effective with very serious and violent offenders. Um, and more importantly, um, using procedural justice and trying to stimulate your legitimacy if, if you're an officer um, is not what we call in the states hug a thug. This is simply not just being nice to uh, violent offenders or being nice to serious offenders. Um, it's not just showing them care and kind of letting them do uh, whatever, uh, whatever they, they want. The Focus Deterrence Program has very strong deterrent um, aspects to it. These are police officers that are absolutely enforcing the law, but they're enforcing that law in a very procedurally just way. And the, it's, it appears that the procedural justice is amplifying the effect of that focused deterrence program. Um, you should take the results a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, we definitely need further testing on this front. Um, for those of you that are uh, familiar with focused deterrence programs, these are multi-pronged, multi-faceted. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces when you look at these programs. And although the evaluations have tried to separate out those different pieces, um, it's very difficult difficult to entangle uh, those effects. So we need more work in that regard. Uh, and then the last application I want to talk with real quickly um, is looking at procedural justice within, within police departments specifically. Normally when we talk about procedural justice, we talk about it from the citizen's perspective. So how, a, uh, how an officer is interacting with a citizen. However, procedural justice is also important to the internal climates of police departments as well. Um, I've talked to many officers um, and I'm kind of shocked at how many officers have told me that uh, within their department they believe that they are treated in a very procedurally unfair manner. Um, and this is problematic because remember departments need officers to internalize department values and goals. When police officers go out on the street they have a lot of discretion to behave any way that they want to when they're out there and there's very little that their supervisors can do to stop them. That's just the nature of the beast. So a department needs police officers to follow their regulations and to follow the law, even if they're not being surveilled. Um, and a way that you do that is you internalize department values and goals. And as I just talked about earlier, procedural justice binds people to groups and it increases identification and it increases value and goal, uh, norm internalization. So the degree to which uh, police officers experience procedural justice within their own departments, so the degree to which police officers are treated respectfully by their supervisors, that they're given a voice, um, that they're treated uh, transparently and accountable and that their supervisors are benevolent, this is going to increase the likelihood that the officers identify with the department and follow department rules and regulations. Um, but it's not just important for the department as well. Um, it's also going to have benefits for officers as well. If you look at the officer stress literature, uh, it's well established that um, unhealthy and maladaptive behavior uh, is very common in policing. Things like alcoholism and drug abuse um, are, are fairly common in policing, and many of these are driven by stress. And then where that stress comes from, and to some extent, is the job that they're doing, but even more so, the stress literature really shows that a lot of officer stress comes from their internal organization, uh, particularly the way that their supervisors treat them. So procedural justice within a police department uh, stands to mitigate this. Um, and then it could also have benefits for the community as well. Um, if a police officer is less stressed, if a police officer, you know, for lack of a better term, is in a good mood, they're much more likely to interact with the public in a positive manner as well. Um, so I do have a paper in which I looked at these kinds of things. So uh, um, I uh, surveyed a large uh, group of sergeants and patrol officers from an urban police department, and I looked at the degree to which procedural justice um, predicted whether or not they viewed their supervisors as legitimate, how cynical they were towards the community, their stress levels, and then I looked at how that uh, was associated with their organizational behavior, um, how they interacted with the community, and whether or not they engaged in these maladaptive behaviors that I was talking about. Um, and again, I'm going to kind of go through this fairly quickly. Um, but we see that 
when officers believe that they're in, that their department is procedurally just, that they themselves are treated in a fair way, uh, they're more likely to see their supervisors as legitimate and feel it is their obligation to follow their supervisor's directives. They're less cynical uh, about the community um, that they're uh, going to police. And they're also less stressed out. They have less psychological and emotional distress. And then, um, Legitimacy and stress increases or decreases depending on uh, what variable you're looking at. The degree to which they engage in behavior that helps the organi uh, organization. Uh, it also increases the, the degree to which they are going to interact with the community in a democratic way that exemplifies democratic uh, ideals. Um, and it's also associated with uh, higher officer well-being as well. Um, so the less officers are cynical about their community or the less they are stressed out, um, the more healthy they are um, in addition. So essentially when officers believe they were treated fairly within a department, uh, you see all these good things happening. Um, uh, they see their supervisors as legitimate, they're less cynical and apathetic about the world around them, uh, they're less psychologically and emotionally stressed, they have higher well-being, um, you know, there's just all kinds of benefits. Um, so I, uh, you're starting to see a lot more impetus to incorporate procedural justice. It's called internal procedural justice. But if you can start to incorporate procedural justice within police departments, uh, that's going to have a lot of really good effects, uh, potentially. And the thing that I want to emphasize is literally everyone stands to win by increasing procedural justice within a police department. The department itself is going to have officers that are more likely to follow their rules and regulations, which I'm sure the supervisors and the administration will be happy about. <coughs> uh, community members um, are going to be more likely to have a uh, uh, interact with departments that exemplify democratic styles of policing. And police officers are going to be less stressed. And that Excuse is the me. end. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me, Doctor. Didn't this actually reshare the screen? Somebody actually shared the screen in between and your uh, screen went off. Oh, my screen went off? Okay. Uh, is it back? Oh. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm just about done. Yeah. So basically all I was saying is that procedural just, if you incorporate procedural justice within two police departments, everybody stands to win here. Uh, the administration and the supervisors, the officers themselves, as well as community members. Um, and I'm completely out of time, but I want to leave you with this quote that I think is very powerful. If the goal is to get police officers to behave democratically, uh, to be respectful, to respect people, um, to give people a voice, to be accountable, to be transparent, to be benevolent, if we want them to exemplify these democratic ideals, then it's incumbent upon um, the organization as well to make sure that they have that same kind of democratic engagement uh, uh, in the areas that they work. Um, so I'm out of time, but this is where I'm going to leave you. Uh, thank you very much um, for um, for inviting me today. Uh, if you're interested, just a couple of quick plugs. If you're interested, uh, you can follow me at uh, I have a there. Um, and if you're interested in the ideas that I discussed today here within the context of adolescence uh, and legal development, uh, I have a new book out, or uh, came out a couple of years ago with Tom Tyler called Why Children Follow the Law, uh, Why Children Follow Rules that builds on a lot of the ideas I talked about today, but again, within an adolescent concept. Okay, uh, so that's all I have. Um, Thanks. Sorry for Thanks. Uh, <laughs> talking so long. Thanks, Dr. Rick. Uh, I have, uh, we have some questions in the chat box. Can I read it for you? Sure. Yeah, it's like, what is scope of deterrent when it comes to practical policing as we believe in human rights? That's one of the questions. Uh, what was that again? What is scope of deterrent when it comes to practical policing as we believe in human rights? I, so, our, so, I'm sorry. Um, 
let me turn my volume up. I don't think I'm hearing you very well. So uh, it's something about human rights, but I can't find the actual question. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, you said uh, this kind of uh, deterrence uh, when it comes to practical policing. So what, how do you, uh, you know, relate the practical policing, deterrence and human rights? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, again, um, so if, the, if I'm finding the question right, how is, how, uh, is practical policing uh, uh, connected to the idea of human rights? Um, well, again, um, procedural justice is really built in a lot of respects on this idea of human rights. If, if we recognize that um, human beings have basic human rights and that those rights should be protected uh, by police, um, you know, things like, um, um, you know, at least in the States, when we talk about due process uh, and we talk about, um, you know, that police shouldn't have complete control and can treat, uh, complete domination over people. Um, again, these are natural rights or these are uh, human rights. Um, <laughs> and if you think about it, men, at least in uh, most every democratic society I've ever looked at, um, Democratic societies are built on these ideas of human rights. These are fundamental values or fundamental norms that kind of structure those particular systems. Um, so that, um, again, the degree to which police exemplify or amplify these particular human rights um, is going to increase the likelihood that people actually view the police as um, sharing their own sense of values or sharing their sense of norms. Um, so the degree to which police officers actually respect human rights um, will increase, <clears throat> will make it more likely that police officers are going to see that, or I'm sorry, that the public is going to see them as legitimate. Um, so yeah, in a very practical sense, respecting human rights is going to amplify the legitimacy of the police um, rather than detract from it. Um, at least from a, 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 the theoretical basis that I, that I was talking about today. Thanks, Dr. Rick. Uh, there are a couple more questions, uh, like regarding uh, abiding to the procedure when, it, when we consider the police stress of controlling and solving crime. Yeah. So somebody actually asked uh, about abiding to the procedure when we consider the police stress and con of controlling and solving the crime, what is the scope of it? So uh, what about um, uh, adhering to procedure just when you're trying to, um, what do you mean by procedure? Do you mean the actual procedures uh, that the regulations that the police department um, are, are laying down? Yeah, it must be, like, uh, okay. the procedure. Yeah, um, this, this actually brings up a really interesting point. So, <laughs> um, so following the procedures that lay that uh, the the department regulations or the procedures that a police department has um, in terms of um, solving crime or enforcing the law or something like that, um, usually that particular that's part of procedural justice if that's the question. Uh, but sometimes we we tend to think about that uh, as something separate. Um, and the reason why is you can imagine, um, you know, you can imagine hypothetically that there might be a department out there that has a particular procedure that they're asking officers to face, right, or to, to follow. I, I don't even imagine what that is, but there's a particular procedure that the officers have to follow, that the department is telling them, this is the procedure you have to follow. But the public may actually view that procedure as procedurally unfair. Um, in a particular way. So if you think about it from this perspective, this puts your, your average line officer kind of in a quandary uh, because in one hand, uh, you have department regulations or department procedures um, that are telling them to do one thing, but on the other hand, um, uh, that might clash or conflict with what the public expects as well. Um, and this is why I, um, things like community policing and things like consistent interaction uh, between um, the public and particularly the administration is so important within a um, 
uh, if you want to create a legitimate police force, because if you're constantly giving the public a voice, if you're constantly getting their feedback, if you're constantly being transparent with the public about what you're doing and why you're doing it, you're going to be able to identify those procedures in terms of the department regulations um, that might be actually causing problems. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but um, you know, if an officer is just going to stand back or if they're just going to say, well, those are the department regulations, I understand it might be creating um, some animus or, or having a delegitimizing effect, but these are what the procedures are. This is what I have to do. Um, I don't know how it is in India, uh, but in the United States, uh, your average citizen has no idea what the actual police procedures are. Um, the average citizen doesn't even know the legal uh, requirements of how the police can and cannot um, interact. Um, so it's it's incumbent upon the officers, again, this is why transparency and accountability is so important, that if there is some kind of procedure that they are following, obviously it's important for them to follow it from a, uh, an employment perspective because that's what their supervisors want, but they should be explaining that the whole time to the citizens. So at least the citizens are understanding why they're doing what they're doing. There's some kind of explanation for that. Thanks, Dr. I, I, I guess uh, that answer leads to another question. Like, okay. how can we overcome the false complaints about police functioning when it comes to police public perception? <laughs> um, yeah, so how can we overcome uh, fall? I'm, I'm assuming uh, you're, you're talking about uh, when citizens lodge complaints that you know, just aren't true. Uh, they're just, yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is actually a tough question to answer. Um, I mean, obviously you have technology, so things like uh, body cameras, uh, dashboard cameras, you know, those kinds of things are, are, are always going to help. Um, <clears throat> You know, and there's always going to be some kind of level of false complaints. Um, and but actually, it, it's interesting. I didn't feature it that much in my talk today, uh, but there is a lot of literature out there uh, showing that procedural, procedurally just policing actually reduces the complaints um, that citizens uh, lodge against police. Um, now you can imagine that those. Um, I mean, within those studies, there's no way to tell which ones were false and which ones were not. Um, but again, if you're reducing the overall complaints, um, <clears throat> you would imagine that some of them are false complaints. Um, I would assume, uh, again, I don't know about the particular context that this is in reference to, um, but I would assume that um, the majority of complaints um, are not false complaints. Um, and false complaints are, um, uh, are, are tricky to um, um, tricky to ascertain if you think about it, uh, because who's to determine if they're false or not? Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, perception. Um, but again, if, if you're going to use a, if you're going to try to incorporate procedural justice within uh, within the way that you police, you're going to reduce complaints. Um, and whether or not those are false complaints or uh, legitimate complaints, um, uh, personally, from my perspective, is kind of uh, uh, a side point. Um, you know, we should just be focused on reducing complaints because uh, whether or not they're false or not, reducing complaints is always good. Thanks, Dr. Rick. I guess uh, that's all. That's all for today. Uh, since uh, that's a, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I guess uh, our uh, chair, Dinesh Kumar Gupta, uh, IPS, he has actually left for a, an important meeting. Okay. So I request uh, Dr. G.B. Aravin, he's actually an associate professor of forensic science and a, uh, an, an advisory committee member of ICFSA to make the concluding remarks. Thank you. Dr. Aravin, Aravin sir, you there? Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, uh, we have had a wonderful webinar from uh, Dr. Rick Trinker uh, today. So he has uh, amply covered most of the areas of uh, procedural justice, not just in the theoretical perspective, but also in the practical aspects also. Uh, I was uh, particularly impressed by the practicality of approach uh, which he has uh, taken up.
so there are so many other issues also that were uh, uh, say also brought out today and i'm sure that uh, most of us uh, will be very valuably benefited and particularly of interest is uh, is the practicality of uh, this area so we do uh, have lots of researches also going on in this area so i am sure that many of the research scholars uh, who are participants today have uh, taken up some lead thank you very much uh, dr rick trinker for uh, your wonderful presentation and uh, we have uh, benefited a lot out of this i'd also like to thank uh, team uh, indian criminology and uh, forensic science association for their wonderful effort in uh, bringing you here uh, in uh, say and uh, making us all go through this uh, thanks again and i'll uh, also like to thank all the participants for the patience uh, and listening uh, today and the questions also thank you very much thank you ran sir uh, thank you dr rick for joining icfsa for the wonderful